has to be closed uh, for the purpose of soloing speech and uh, you know uh, lot of things otherwise the regurgitation through the nose and you know lots of uh, functions will be affected so uh, this is very important to uh, correct it can you just go one slide before uh, yeah just go one slide eleven can you yes, go one sir. slide before? yes yeah. sir before the prior one yeah uh, now just wanted to put this way that they have found that in indian specifically in indian and the north uh, south american population the length of the palate is little shorter compared to that of other european and the american this actually a study long study they have done it so we have a deficiency of the length of the palate that means starting from uvula to pharynx there is a little bit of a deficiency which has been noticed a more wider more shorter palate have been noticed in india and uh, the question is whether one technique will fit all the type of cleft palate we will discuss that as we come into the cases can you just go into the next one yeah yes. so now if you see here uh, a cleft palate can actually associate as you see here uh, can i use the uh, okay no, uh, no, as i speak i think you can, yes, you can just I, the, uh, I will do that sir yes cleft palate you know can be isolated the cleft palate can be uh, unilateral the cleft can uh, palate can be bilateral when it is associated with uh, uh, cleft lip and alveolus so we are looking into uh, different forms of cleft palate here and you can see that in this the child uh, the last picture where there is a continuation of cleft palate uh, from the uh, lip to the alveolus into the nose and what you are seeing in the middle is the the septum and the vomer okay sorry septum will be here in the on the top that's the vomer uh, tissue there and the whole thing is opened up okay so we we have a situation here where there is a total communication between the oral cavity and the nasal cavity everything is exposed okay next one yeah now if you look at this this is only the complete soft palate okay soft palate alone and when you look at this the last the pictures at the bottom here you will find that this the, there is a uvular cleft here cleft uvula along with that you may find that there is a, a deficiency of uh, can you come down to the lower level that the first picture on the lower level yeah that's a uvular cleft and uh, and you can also see just above the uvula uh, on the first picture there is a transparent area there is an arrow structure that is the area actually which does not have three layer and what you see the fold on the side on the same picture the fold that's actually the muscle in fact the muscle is not continuous so these type of uh, cleft which are actually not completely divided but the mucosa is closed but the muscle is not closed and the uvula is not closed and which is called as the submucous cleft submucous cleft okay next one and if we go to the treatment aspect okay can i go to the next one yeah so what is the goal i think it's very important as uh, surgeons will say make a plan and pattern for this plan you have to know what you are going to do it you have to know that okay what exactly you are planning to do it okay so one is that you have to create an anatomically nature cleft palate and also very important just not anatomically nature at that point of time this child from the age of 9 to 12 months or whatever the age you are going to close it 9 to 12 months again i'm repeating is very important to understand that because 12 months is very important as the child is starting to speak just before that we are doing the uh, procedure and to prevent you know to improve the nutritional aspect normal sucking feeding swallowing all these patterns will be developed when we do the uh, surgery at that point of time so very important things are one is function another one is the speech next one yeah the principles of palatal repair i will go a little bit more uh, detail when i go to the next uh, this thing can i go to the next slide instead of uh, yeah keep going eleven l you have to keep going yeah look at this picture is it the next one the previous one is it i wanted to show this picture is very important what you see is the first room from what you are watching and what you are watching inside the one with the flower pot everything is the nasal cavity 
I will consider the closure of the pallet is equal to like closing the door. Some cases, most of the cases is like closing the door, where you are you tend to close the door from the nasal cavity towards the oral cavity. Okay, so once you can do this, you will able to actually produce a good seal. But the question is, many times that uh, the door is not of sufficient size. It, uh, it may be shorter, it may be wide, the width may be a little smaller. So all these issues can come uh, with uh, the door and that is where the issues comes with it. Next one. Yeah, now there are uh, techniques. For example, let us say if we are looking onto the soft palate, okay. In the soft palate, you can go for a, a simple technique, which is an age old technique, which is from 1861. Uh, you have incisions placed. Uh, can you use, move your cursor? Because I can't move it from here, from my side. Yeah, and uh, from the lateral aspect and from the, the uh, towards the rim of the palate. And you move it to the center. Here, what is important is that uh, the anterior detachment is not done. Please remember the detachment in the anterior area have not been done in a von Langenberg procedure. Okay, and we move to the center. Closure is done, always the cleft palate closure is done in three layers, remember that. That is nasal layer, then the muscle layer and the palatal layer. Okay, nasal, muscle and the palatal layer. So here, two things will not happen. What happens is that it is just moved to the medial aspect and you'll have a raw area on the side. You can see a raw area on the side there, okay? And what does not happen is that you don't push it backward. Excellent technique, if you can do the muscle closure very well, the muscle function normally, and you should get a good uh, closure. That is a speech development and other things. The, the blood supply is maintained, you don't have much issues with it. The problem comes only with one uh, issue in this case. Suppose if the posterior aspect, can you show the cursor at the posterior aspect of the sutured area? At this area where you have a problem, okay? There, if there is a problem with it, then uh, you can have uh, uh, issues with, uh, you know, the length of the palate, the length of the palate. Then you might have to probably go down and correct this. Next one. So let us take it into the next, uh, this thing. You can see here, whatever I showed you here, I'm just showing you here in the clinical aspect, this, the incision made. Next one. The Dingman in place, incision is made. Can you continue? Can you continue, please? Okay. And you can see that the flap is uh, done. Okay. And the flap is moved towards the medial aspect and there's a raw area. So we can put some, uh, you know, materials like uh, surgical or something there and allow it to close secondarily. So this is just moving from the side to the center, just closing the door from the nasal cavity towards the oral cavity. Okay. Right. Next one. Right, there's another technique what is called as VY pushback. Okay, you can see there in the VY pushback, what you see here, that the incision is extended from the anterior area and you are raising two flaps here. Okay, again, this is more useful for uh, uh, the, the, the cleft, which is extending into the soft palate or even to the anterior palate, where we have to completely raise it. Where do we, we do this normally if you wanted to push it back? You wanted to you got a short palate. Lengthwise, there is a short palate, and you wanted to push it back. So there is no other way apart from uh, cutting in the anterior area. And the pedicle what you use is the greater palate. Okay, next one, please. Next one, please. This is another technique, Bardak uh, two flap technique. So almost a similar technique here compared to the other one. Next one. I just want to get into the technique. Eleven, I think, is it a problem in moving? There is a delay, sir. There is a delay. Oh, okay. That's okay. I just wanted to know. Yeah. So you can yes, see sir. here, uh, you can see here that the palatal flaps have been marked. This is a patient with a cleft lip and palate together. Okay. This is Bardock's two flap technique. So what happens here? Both the flaps are raised from the side here. Okay. And pedicled onto the greater palatine. Then you have two layer, three layer technique here. That is palatal layer nasal layer and the muscle layer okay and then the first the nasal layer is closed in the anterior to the posterior then the uvula is closed then the muscle you can see here this is a nasal layer closed 
Okay, can you show the nasal layer and the cursor, please? Yes. Yeah. Okay, then the, you can see the muscle. Actually, the muscle should continue this way, transverse like this. Okay, but instead of it is going and attaching onto the posterior aspect of the heart palate. Okay, so that is dissected out and being brought back in the next picture. You can see that it's been brought back into the posterior most area of the soft palate. So you have to dissect this muscle and bring it back. And that muscles are very important. There are three, four muscles which are very important. Extremely important. The muscles which are in this case is absolutely important. This is the levator. Okay. Then the uh, tensor is there. Uh, uh, the palatopharyngeus and then the palatoglossus and the musculus uvula. We know about all these things. And very important is the levator. 60 to 70 percent of the muscle bulk in the soft palate is consist of the levator muscle. And if we can get an excellent closure of the levator muscle and you know bringing it from backward, okay, from backward to front, okay, backward to front, so that you can from there you bring it down like this. If you can bring it the elevation of the palate becomes proper and it is very crucial if you want to develop a good speech, the closure of the, the muscle is extremely important. Okay, and you can leave it and you can see here that the muscle closure, what has been done, what is called as the velum, closed with the muscle, uh, very, very important step, take a lot of time, very, very uh, uh, meticulously done. The more time you take to close it, the muscle and uh, the soft tissues, uh, the layers, the better result you get it. Okay, if you hurry, hurry, then you'll end up in all the uh, fistulas and other problems. Muscle may not function and the speech issues will come back. Okay, next one, please. Yeah, there are some people also does what is called as furlow double set plasty. What they normally do is that, that anteriorly the closure is equal to uh, something like what we have already explained. Okay, then what you can do without raising the anterior uh, area, it was at plastic in the posterior area. Some people like to do it, but normally in our center in Meenakshi, we like to do the Bardak's uh, two flap technique, which we find it more. How do you decide? It's purely depend upon the technical expertise of the surgeons, you know, what result you are getting it. You have to wait and see one year, two years, depend upon what type of result you are getting it. Then you can plan what will be done with it. Okay. So I think it is very important to do the muscle closure. If you do a good muscle closure, with a good soft palate lengthening. Ideally speaking, you should get, you can see in the uh, first diagram, very important, the soft palate should go and rest against the uh, pharynx, posterior wall of the pharynx. And that's what is very important. So if you can get that seal between soft palate and the pharynx, you can avoid escape of the air from the trachea, from the oral pharynx into the nose. And that is very important. If you can avoid it, the speech will become better. If there is an, a nasal escape of air, then the chances of uh, developing a hypernasality is very common. Next one. Can you go to the next one? I think we already yes, discussed it. So are we, are we now yes. stopping with this or are we going to go ahead? Yes, Let's sir, we to... will finish a few more questions. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. I, I will move on to the next question. The ideal treatment age for cleft rhinoplasty, what would that be? and uh, comparison between open and uh, closed rhinoplasty and their indications. Right. Right. Okay, thank you. So let us say that now, you know, uh, can you show me then one picture, behind, one after this? Uh, next one, I'll just show that. Or, yeah. Let us say what is the problem here? No, the, okay, you can go to the next one, that the one. You can have a look at it, what we could happen with the first uh, picture here. There is a total, Dyspormology of the cleft side nose. The midline is, uh, you know, gone to the other side towards the non-cleft side, and there is a total widening. The cartilages are uh, become uh, totally uh, uh, deformed, and there is a big fistula happening between the nose and the oral cavity. So, in this particular uh, cases, what happens? The question is, are we going to do anything with the nose along with the lip? That's always the question. Okay. In the past, a lot of people try to uh, intervene and try to operate the lip with the nose and they have had problems with it in a long term. Okay, what are the problems they found that, you know, this could uh, lead into some form of uh, uh, growth deficit because the surgery were more uh, radical in nature and this radical nature of the uh, tip of the nose probably may uh, uh, produce uh, some amount of uh, growth deficit as the child uh, grows. 
and that then people thought why to operate on the nose so let us do only the lip then then come back for it okay let us see later stage so this is this is uh, you know i have put one uh, sentence here sir harold gillis so treat the primary defect first you can see that that was the concept from day one so now the rhinoplasty what we are doing here can be divided into three types here okay primary rhinoplasty where we are doing at the time of lip repair there are a lot of people are out now preferring to do it intermediate rhinoplasty you can do something between if you like to do it between 5 to 11 years okay or the third one after the age completion when the child is become completely 18 years or 20 years you know you can do a final uh, uh, rhinoplasty okay i tend to normally do it at the end of it some of the cases nowadays we are doing primary rhinoplasty okay along with the cleft lip can you go to the next one now if you look at it you can see here there are four technique in uh, doing a rhinoplasty or how to correct the nose it's more of more of a i i will say more more than rhinoplasty i will say how to get the nose symmetry that is very important okay and very important again never do today what can be honorably be put off till tomorrow again the concept old all this concept please remember okay but please remember as the surgeon's experience are changing it people can change what they exactly they wanted it new things are coming people learn new techniques a new concept new uh, evidence comes off so nasal alveolar molding one you can improve the nasal symmetry okay can i go back to the old slides next previous slide yeah you can correct only the septum during the lip you can do the rim rhinoplasty what is called a semi open or you can do open rhinoplasty so you have four options to correct the nose okay next one here nasal alveolar molding is one technique people find it is extremely useful so here with this uh, technique of nasal alveolar molding it can bring some amount of uh, nasal symmetry before even going for a lip correction and it is very important one have to learn it how to correct this uh, the lip uh, symmetry and the patient has to come correctly for 3 months and it does wonders in some hands it really got wonders and some of them are doing wonderful work in india now and there are training courses available how to do this nasal alveolar molding to get the symmetry before surgery next one please and you can do a primary rhinoplasty so a primary uh, lip correction with uh, just a simple closed uh, dissection of the nose that is one of these cases what you are seeing it simple closed correction what we do normally with the scissors we go in and do a little dissection of the uh, uh, that's what normally i tend to do it okay depends on the center to center whatever you want to do it and uh, dissect all the uh, lr cartilages and try to bring the symmetry of course it will have little bit of issues of symmetry getting it but lip is closed fantastic okay right next one next one this is another technique what is called a tajima next one please and you can see if you want you can correct during primary rhinoplasty okay you have to extend the incision from this c flap on to the uh, affected side of the nose and excess remove the excess you can see here on the second picture there is a lot of excess uh, skin there on the nasal uh, uh, can you see on the top the i think doctor alone can you just go up onto the dotted area on the three dots three dot alone yeah. there you have lot of excess skin and excess fold as well that can be removed and that can be done by by using this technique what is called as tajima incision okay one can go through all these articles and i will explain that how to make it better intraoperative marking in bilateral cases next one next please yeah okay and sometimes after all these things if you still wanted to make sure that the nasal morphology is not changed what you can use is some simple conformers these conformers are actually very useful though original conformers are little expensive about 50 60 dollars and for our money it is very expensive some of them are 100 dollars but this is actually some of these uh, uh, techniques in fact dr mustafa actually had put in this in couple of days ago in our group and he said he uses a uh, 
you know, certain nasopharyngeal tube which are transparent can be made like this, like a conformer, and which can be retained uh, behind. Okay, these are some of the pictures, uh, you know, which Indian uh, version of that, how we can do it, which will actually help in breathing as well as maintaining that. This conformers can be left behind till two months. Keep on changing it. You have to teach the parents how to do it and keep on changing it. That will actually help in getting the nasal shape. Next one. Okay. Then if the patient is becoming grown, you can do what is called as uh, uh, rhinoplasty in adult stage. And the first, second pic, this is the first picture is a normal cartilage. Second picture is the deformed cartilage. Third one, that what you want to do it. You can see that you have to raise this lateral level cartilage to the extent that on the right side. Okay, so there's a collapse here. Collapse onto the tip, collapse onto the lateral level, collapse onto the, uh, you know, the projection. Okay, columnar tip is totally uh, uh, grouped. And next procedure, next picture shows how we want, to, you can see the arrow, how you want it to go up and how you want it to support the middle area. Next picture. Most of the surgeries, whatever we do it now, we always very important with, uh, 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 with the cleft lip and the palate is that extremely important that with the rhinoplasty. I insist, now earlier I never used to do it. I never understood the importance of doing it. But now we do what is called as septorhinoplasty. Septum always and always, not in bilateral, but in unilateral, there is a deviation. You have to correct the septum. If you don't correct the septum, the patient cannot breathe properly. And if he cannot breathe properly, without septum correction, you cannot bring the nose to the middle area. You cannot bring it anything to the, uh, the, the support, the breathing. So the rhinoplasty is not only done to correct, the, uh, uh, to look better or normal, also very important to make sure that the breathing is very important, okay? And this is one picture which is showing the rib cartilage have been used, okay? And whatever the, you can see a strut in the middle. You can see a cephalic strip have been added onto the affected side. And you have a, a batten graft there, okay? Two batten graft there. And sometimes you have to do a little skin graft or you know, in an area where there is to correct all these things. This is a one patient's photograph just showing that all these procedures corrected and how you can change the nose from, you know, a, a deformed cleft nose into something very acceptable. A lot of things can be done with it, okay? It requires a lot of uh, corrections. So septorhinoplasty is the technique ideally done when the, when the patient grows up and becomes adult, okay? And a lot of many times, many times that though we can use an auricular graft in very simple forms, if we wanted to do all these corrections, we need to do a, what is called as a, a chondral graft from the chest. We have to take it, shape all the cartilage and do all these uh, necessary corrections. Next one, please. Yeah, this is open rhinoplasty. I just told you about it. I don't want to continue with it. Keep going. Okay, keep going. Now, as I told you, because there are a lot of surgeons are preferring rhinoplasty, <clears throat> primary rhinoplasty along with the keloplasty, and they do what is called as semi-open. You don't open, you open only on the cleft side, one side. You can see in the picture here, towards the cleft side, you open, make a rim incision, then try to elevate this and uh, do it, okay? There are a lot of people are now doing what is called a semi-open rhinoplasty, right? Okay, that is about the rhinoplasty. You wanted to get on with the third question? The third question. This is about uh, the different treatment algorithms for syndromic patients. I think it is a very, very, very vast question, but doesn't matter. I will just uh, uh, tell you about uh, what can be done with, uh, I think there's a classification which I think have been put up and uh, it is American Association of Cleft Lip and Palate, Facial Cleft Hypertrophy, Hypertrophy, Hyperplasia, Neoplasia, Cranial and Classified. I do, I, I'm not going into that. You can all, uh, you know, probably see the books. Let us come into the sequence that what you can do with the syndrome. Can I go to the next one? Yeah. Uh, can you little enlarge? Uh, yeah. If you see the, can you show the top? Yeah. See, look at that. Now what you can see here, initial assessment at the primary level at the medical unit or whatever. See the first thing with any craniofacial syndrome, including cleft lip and palate. Because, you know, you can get syndromic cleft lip and palate. It's very important to understand that as well. So where 
where there is an initial assessment always done by it's a teamwork please remember that it is a teamwork okay a pediatrician or a neonatologist then we look into whether the child has any any features of a craniosynostosis okay whether there is a congenital vault asymmetry orbital asymmetry ear problems okay cranial vault deformities at protrusion depressions in any all this to be examined and if there is yes okay assessment of at the combined clinic that is craniofacial along with neurosurgical uh, combination okay and if there is no other issues clinical follow up at the primary level medical unit by the pediatrician or this thing suppose if you have a craniosynostosis after evaluating with the uh, patient suppose if there is a uh, 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 problem with uh, uh, you know uh, craniosynostosis what you can do then we take normally a ct scan find out the diagnosis whether you have the scaphocephaly trigonocephaly and you know uh, whether there is any uh, plague cephaly or other types of craniosynostosis okay so the, the sequence should be and once that to start with the team work whether there is some internal brain issues or the cephaly or is it only an external problem where exactly is the problem the team work after the team sees it we take a ct scan find out the diagnosis can you go to the next one okay and at the age of probably you have discussing with all assessment have to be done in this case of thalamic assessment psychologist geneticist everybody sees it first okay everything completion done you can probably do some cranioplasty okay at the age of 7 to 8 months if there is an issue with brain development if you wanted to allow the brain to develop you can do that okay then you can also do what is called as pronto orbital remodeling cranioplasty or osteogenic distraction to correct certain types of uh, pronto orbital advancement i think we have one more uh, the chart can we go into that next that will give you a bit yes. more uh, idea about what to be done with it yeah so this is another chart which explains about uh, uh, everybody can see that the referral uh, 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 from that is a combination of okay you have to understand that you have to have a lot of knowledge at least you have to sit with the neuro pediatric neurosurgeon and the neuro neuro physician the neonatologist a lot of people to sit and discuss what can be done with this type of patients in the childhood okay so the same thing here what has been present here the age of presentation what age they present with is very very important okay and very important to understand whether there is an increased intracranial pressure icp if that is a case then probably we might do some initial uh, <clears throat> you know uh, uh, use of a, a stenting okay and that has to be done and the after that then the correction of the cranio uh, uh, stenosis and the stereokinesis may be followed by what is called as frontal orbital advancement so this is all in the textbook you can go through it so very vast topic i cannot just explain uh, over that you know so what is important it is a combination of uh, neurosurgical craniofacial work we concentrate on first priority goes for brain development if you have to do the brain development two things have to be done sometimes there, there is any issues with ventricle issues with intracranial pressure first correct that then you give the space for the cranium to develop or the brain to develop by doing restructuring of the uh, cranium itself okay correction of cranial stenosis and if there is an orbital issue big uh, xr or pro, you know uh, problem with exophthalmosis and all the thing if the eye is going to get affected then the frontal part is going to get affected then uh, you need what is called as a front orbital advancement either by osteotomy or by distraction nowadays a lot of people do distraction okay right next one very important extremely important that patient's clinical and tomographic features understand what type of problem next one child social and uh, sorry the previous one child social and uh, uh, demographic aspect very very important third factor that uh, you cannot do any craniofacial surgery unless you have a technical expertise in both uh, treating craniofacial center only can do it with because there are a lot of post operative issues and other things can come into it okay right next one please 
next one can you go to the next one yes sir uh, i'm showing the patient's photographs we'll get into that yeah we'll we will show come to the end because i'm running out of time yeah can we can we get into the next one yeah question mark yeah okay, okay. go ahead uh, the, the, there is a question regarding uh, the choice of treatment uh, for cleft patients whether it has to be osteotomy or distraction okay so very valid question and i have been fighting with the same question for last 20 years to be very frank i still don't have a very conclusive answer okay i will do for this or that because uh, as the time goes in as you become more experienced with uh, cleft surgery and the mid place hyperplasia you have lot of uh, problems so one of the issues with the hyperplasia maxillary hyperplasia as we know that that the issue of hyperplasia is purely because there is a scarring which happens in the lip scarring which happens in the alveolus scarring which happens in the palate scarring which happens behind the uh, tuberosity all this can actually stop the uh, uh, the maxilla from growing and the incidence is sometimes very high depend upon how radically you do it okay so uh, the problem with uh, normally in the past before about 10 15 years ago before the uh, uh, real technique of uh, uh, you know understanding the concept about uh, uh, craniofacial uh, distraction osteotomy was the only option probably about 15 20 years ago osteotomy was the only option and then came the distraction came into the place from 19 uh, we all know that from 1992 and we start in fact why started doing this from 2000 four or five for last uh, 15 years we are doing distraction for the maxilla okay so uh, there are a lot of centers all over the world they do both okay they do the both let me just go to the next slide then it will give up see the question is always in a patient something like a cleft lip and palate severe mid face deficiency it could be mild moderate or severe what do you really want to do it for a mild one there is no question about it 6 to 7 mm one can really do a simple osteotomy and finish it off enough if the mandible is normal we can bring the maxilla forward do a normal plating and you can get fantastic result okay next one please if we are doing a distraction we have now lot of options that is one beauty about it with a distraction compared to that of uh, 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 osteotomy osteotomy we can do only leaf four to one osteotomy ideally speaking up to 10 mm nowadays i don't do distraction because i have we, have, we can prove that up to 8 to 10 mm the distract the osteotomy is still the best option in a experienced hand two things are very important good mobilization number two bringing it forward and fixing it is very important i always use 2 mm plate number 3 putting a bone graft at the site of the osteotomy site three very crucial point three very crucial point we'll come into that can you go back to one slide before just finish that off yeah so here in distraction we have anterior maxillary distraction leaf foot one internal leaf foot one external and leaf foot two level distraction in case where there is a naso maxillary uh, deficiencies okay go back to the next one please yeah. go go to the next one yeah this is one case where we have done uh, anterior amd we lot of surgeons in india we do this now very simple in fact this is becoming like a you know sort of a technique of indian uh, way of doing hypoplastic correction in uh, india the hypoplasia we do between uh, two premolars if possible depend upon the type of dentition we decide whether to do it between the first molar or between the pre molar we decide on that okay and in this next one you can see an osteotomy done equal to an anterior maxillary uh, osteotomy and we put a, a, a distractor okay which is actually nothing but a transverse distractor which is used for lateral expansions we just keep it in the anterior posterior direction okay expand it okay keep on expanding normally we we can go up to uh, 13 mm and you can see the cuts next one yep and you can see how much it has come forward only anterior maxillary distraction non leaf foot one here non leaf foot one okay we have 
jumped the maxilla forward up to 9 10 11 up to 13 millimeter you can jump it depend upon the size of the distractor what you are going to use it okay next one please and you can see one of the patient before and after okay as the time goes in can you go to the next one you can see a distractor in place and you can see the gap what is produced and sometimes you can get a little complication of have a fistula here you can see at the end here third picture be very careful about it you can develop specifically in bilateral cleft lip and palate be very careful with this case yes it is developed after about six months i closed with a local flap locally available that is a movement of the flap completely closed without any problem okay and you can see once that is done orthodontic treatment is done next one This is one case I told you up to 10 millimeter, you can do wonderful result with the leaf foot one osteotomy. This is a case of a leaf foot one osteotomy. I told you already about it, eight to 10 millimeter. Next one. Yeah, that is from leaf foot maxilla. You can bring it forward and you can jump it forward into front of the mandible. Next one, next one. Just want to show you what to do with the next one. Yeah, intraoral distractor. You can see in a maxilla, you go to an intraoral distractor. Osteotomy is the same. Mobilization. You don't down fracture too much here. What you require is an anteroposterior movement. Very very important. Anteroposterior. You have to move it front and backward. You don't have to down fracture too much. Sometimes if you can do a very good anterior posterior movement, that's more than enough. A good movement. I will do a good movement of anteroposterior by breaking the junction and fix the distractor like what is shown here. Okay, next one. And this is one example that use of intraoral distractor. You can see it very useful. Patient doesn't have to you know you, you don't have to you know take off and from the college and walk around you know without you can go to the normal college once you do 13 14 15 millimeter whatever the movement you know you can get a result something equal to this and of course the patient had a little genioplasty in this patient of course at the end of the day but i just want to show you with an internal leaf foot one distractor you can come to a similar situation like a normal uh, facial balance next one another patient mid face deficiency next one you can see how much the mid face have been brought forward with the rhinoplasty that is the end result okay next one you can see the distractor in place here in the, one of these uh, x-rays you can see okay how much we are really brought forward you can see that after uh, closure next one yeah that is the finish before and after you can see it okay sometimes the problem is not only at the maxillary level, but also at the nasomaxillary level. Then you need a little higher osteotomy, like leaf foot two. Can you go to the next one? Leaf foot two level, where we are going to go into the uh, leaf foot two level, where we have to sometimes go through the coronal approach to a leaf foot two osteotomy, including the part of the nasolacrimal sac, the infrabatal area, then commit to intraorally, then combine it. Okay. Do this, then fix an RED distractor. You can't do this with the internal distractor. It has to be an RED, okay? Then we'll have two uh, anchorage, one onto the teeth or into the bone, maxilla, another one into the nose. You can see the next slide here. You can see that here, okay? Done, cut. You can see one pin onto the nasal area, another one onto the uh, teeth here, okay? Both helps in actually, uh, pulling the whole maxilla in a leaf foot two level forward next one next we can see the uh, approach coronal osteotomy leaf foot two the uh, distractor in place what is called as red with a two uh, anchorage point next one and that is the amount of pull what you see it at the end of the day okay and that is the you can see the pre-operative from there the first slide can you go to the first this thing the, uh, yeah, no, the next one, please. I wanted to show the difference between the preoperative one here to the mid face, what happened to the mid face, the fullness, what you can get it. So, this is leaf 4211. Okay, so there are a lot of options. Simple leaf 4211 osteotomy up to 8 to 10 millimeter, you can really do it. 
or if you want to go for distraction you can do amd internal distractor external distractor or red e42 level thank you okay next one next one so the next question is about uh, the different types of graphs used for abg the advantages or disadvantages what you would prefer uh, for a good success rate right okay alveolar bone grafting is something which normally there are a lot of uh, debate happening now from you know there are a lot of people surgeons nowadays uh, from old time not now last 20 25 years people are doing what is called to start with the primary i told you primary uh, lip that is chelaplasty with rhinoplasty the same thing you can do with uh, gingiva periosteoplasty at the time of lip surgery at the time of lip surgery please remember that means if you can close this uh, can you go to the uh, sc scroll on the top there on the picture there please not that the previous one yeah here onto that area the defect on the top there that's it if you can get a good closure if you can get a good good closure of the periosteum peri muco periosteum together in a primary uh, uh, lip along with uh, keloplasty you can even get uh, a good bone formed in between that is the advantage of we were talking about naso alveolar molding so the naso alveolar molding not only mold the uh, nose the nasal part it also brings the alveolus together please remember that it also brings the alveolus together if you can bring the alveolus together and if you can close the muco periosteum together during the uh, lip surgery what is called as gingiva periosteoplasty at the time of primary lip closure you can get even a good bone in between that's the first stage of uh, bone grafting the second stage lot of people are now doing at the age of 5 before even uh, the lateral or central is erupted a lot of people are doing it because they 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 feel that if we do that at the age of 5 years the eruption pattern the width what is happening between the two uh, 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 that the gap in between the two alveolus that's a cleft side and non cleft side can be reduced and the old concept of after 9 years that you can do it that any of this can be followed okay but general tendency is to do between 9 to 10, 10 years so that you can you know go take a nice graft from the iliac area and put it there we have lot of options iliac graft tibia rib chin graft and everything but i think there is consensus are only two one is iliac and another one is tibia in our center in love where we are doing it i think 99% 90% of the centers they do iliac very easy abundant bone you can remove it you know and uh, 15 minutes you can take a graft and come out of it okay and this is one you know just showing you that that's a fistula between oral cavity and the nose the first important thing is to close this fistula for that you have to raise a naso periosteal flap otherwise called as ab homes technique okay so close this naso periosteal flap take a, a bone graft from the iliac area costo uh, that is uh, sorry the uh, cortico cancellus bone graft okay first layer is a nasal layer then you can put the bone graft then the oral layer everything is closed so what is the purpose of doing a alveolar bone grafting is actually nothing but to get a continuity between the two uh, two uh, maxilla together it will allow the uh, teeth to erupt into that uh, uh, area of the defect it will allow also allows the nose to go up into the area of the to produce that prominence there are lot of advantages you can also use synthetic bioactive materials into this area next one you can see here you can use hydroxypatite you can use tcp you can use a bone graft you can get lot of uh, bone graft nowadays uh, you know uh, in the market uh, autologous or uh, heterologous bone graft or home, you know you can buy this and put it okay it's like expensive but you can do it and you can also use next one on the top of that you can use prp or prf whatever you want if you have bmp still better the bone can form uh, very well actually so you can add it if you don't want to take it from the patient's body you can buy all these things and put it so you have lot of options okay options of having the bio materials like hydroxide or tcp you can buy the bone okay all these things can be done with it next one next one okay and of course 
with iliac of course you have a very minimal uh, issue of uh, having pain and the gait disturbances and everything at least for 8 to 10 days but normally children they come out of with it in in my center you know like they start walking on the next day itself which is not a big issue at all next day they start walking a little bit of gait disturbances for a couple of days you just you know pat them at the back and tell them you know to do a little exercise third day you can discharge them without any trouble yeah thank so the, you the next question is about hemifacial microsomia the most uh, practical classification and the different treatment options yeah i think the practical classification we know about it is a cabans which we know about it okay next one we'll finish the talk and we'll ask the questions uh, first uh, yes we can take it later yes we take it later yeah so we are very important i think from the pg side i will divide this class in into cabans uh, you know class 1 where you have deficiency there's a mild deficiency on one side part of the condyle and the ramus and the mandible appears to be shorter that is type 1 type 2 a and type 2 b and 3 type 2 a is you can see the hypoplastic condyle coronoid may be missing small ramus length of the mandible is again uh, so 2a that is 2b rudimentary condyle no may not be any coronoid very small ramus you may not be having any ramus at all and very small body of the mandible and type 3 we have what is called as prosencies classification of uh, cabans is this that absolutely no ramus no condyle no coronoid and part of the body also missing so the treatment is based on purely on this what you want to do with it okay there are a lot of classifications which are there then there are omens classification sat classification all of you can go through that uh, this thing what is important here when the when you see a child with uh, this thing it's very important that you know how to uh, rehabilitate this child okay it's all depend upon what you see whether it's a type 1 or type 2a or b or type 3 okay that right. next one can you go to the next slide so if it is a when the child is born with a hemifacial microsomia in infancy the problem we have actually treated you know multitude of patient in our center and we have published lots of articles including in uh, growth and development of the children and also very important about their airway obstructive sleep apnea okay so airway is a big problem the swallowing is a problem okay hearing difficulties may come with it and the deformity some of them are having also deformity with the cleft as well the lateral cleft and hearing difficulty the facial nerve problem lot of this problem they come out with it in a growing child you know we can actually do a distraction soft tissue free fat ear reconstruction nerve deficit you know it's very difficult sometimes but there are a lot of people if there's a total nerve deficit on the facial nerve deficit you can go for a grafting and other techniques to improve it okay and when the child becomes adult you have a definite correction with a distraction with orthognathic surgery fat graft or microvascular free flaps so there are lot of techniques you can do depend upon what age you are going to see the child okay the same thing what i told you about it skeletal corrections okay normally suppose if there is a type 3 let us say it's just type 3 example and you don't have a condyle if you have a long costo chondral graft there is no harm in it you can always use a costo chondral graft and wait for the condyle to develop into something in a type 3 where there is no condyle or if you have a type 2b again there is no condyle you can do a costo chondral graft where there is a chondral that a condyle is missing you can do a costo chondral graft equal to something like a ankylosis release you want the condyle and the mandible to grow in that case you can do this okay suppose if you have a uh, can you go one slide back please 11 yeah sorry because that in a case of a type 2a alone you can do even a condyle distraction if there is a problem you can do a condyle distraction you can try to lengthen it as well or as i told you in type 2b as well if there is a ready rudimentary condyle is available you can do a distraction neo condyle distraction in that case next one and this is again we have explained already okay very important what age you can do it correction of obstructive sleep apnea is very important growth of the mandible is very important when the mandible growth improves the maxilla growth improves okay and you can do distraction osteogenesis at any age starting from uh, infancy 
to adolescent to adult okay you can put bone graft you can put correct the obstructive sleep apnea then the orthodontic treatment very very important as the child grows they, there has to be a contemporary intermediate orthodontic treatment with orthodontic treatment only you can bring the occlusion definitely no doubt about it okay next one so we have a protocol on to this thing i think it's all going to come into the net you can one can really go through it you can see here airway management correction of oral official clefting cleft pilot correction sometimes they come with cranial bolt correction <laughs> depend upon what age you are going to you know sort of uh, see the baby and uh, what is the problem is all about one minute sorry you can do an ear reconstruction orthodontic treatment maxilla mandibular corrections okay next one <coughs> next one so orthodontic surgery plays a big role in 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 adult okay that's very important what you are showing it here in an adult you have to do a leaf fourth one probably bilateral sagittal split along with uh, l shape osteotomy on the, uh, the affected side bone grafting fat grafting sometimes even free uh, uh, microvascular flap to correct the affected side normally okay next one please yeah the next okay. question is about uh, the different types of scar management uh, in cleft lip and palate patients and the usual problems associated with them i think the scar management must start with uh, uh, lip repair is very important because you know if we can do a a traumatic correction that if you can do a very very important that lip is uh, carefully handled the uh, suturing should be as small as possible like 6070 70, okay then uh, removal of suture is very important that the you know right time 5 to 6 uh, days rather than weaving it of course a lot of people nowadays use uh, resorbable sutures like uh, 5 or 60 uh, bicycle rapido and that is very very important so it starts with if there is a scar developing of course some of the children has a tendency to develop hypertrophic scar some of them get keloid is very rare in dip but you can get it yes i have got a couple of patients which are very very uh, uh, bad scar you can get it hypertrophic i never had a patient with a keloid developing in the cleft lip but hypertrophic can be uh, seen with it definitely it's a, it's a problem with it okay so um, how to avoid uh, this thing try to close the cleft lip with uh, multiple like uh, you can see here for example a milla technique which runs in a round or in a z shape or you know whatever what we are uh, you can see the picture all these uh, instead of a straight line closure all the straight lines will tend to contract please remember all the straight line of a uh, closure of the uh, any scar in the face or in anywhere in the body will tend to contract that is why we have to you know sort of uh, make this in multiple segmentations next one okay people can do after surgery in my center what we do immediately after the healing of one first month we start massaging with the contractopex or mederma okay keep on massaging for 3 to 6 months break all the subdermal collagen and improve it okay you can even lubricating gel with the vitamin e gel okay so there are so many things you can do it okay there are so many things you can apply silicone gel you can keep applying that silicone gel you can inject after suppose if you find after two one or two years uh, you can even inject a steroid but the correct dose is very important and very diluted dose otherwise sometimes you can get a lot of uh, 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 patches onto the skin developing in the local area you can get a lot of hypodermic uh, Uh, patches the color becoming change in the skin is very very uh, problematic in the with uh, this thing or if you have a problem with something like this the scar with uh, correction of the uh, symmetry you can do what is called as uh, multiple uh, z plasties okay that also can be done with it so that will correct two things one is the scar will get corrected number two it also improves the cosmetic so always in the scar a straight line closure scar always very important to break the scar make it into z plasties 
Z plastic, if you do it, the advantage of Z plastic, if you go through the principles of plastic surgery, the advantage of Z plastic, the scant contracture is very, very, very minimal in comparison to a straight line closure. Okay, that is what you wanted it. Next one, please. Let us me take the next question. Eight. Yes. Yeah. Um, the students want to know in detail about the Pierre Robin syndrome, the management techniques and uh, the I outcomes. Do. Yes. Yeah, we are running very late, but let me finish it in a couple yes, of uh, five minutes. That's yes. it. Yeah. So we know that three very important things here, that congenital micrognathia, glossopstosis, and airway problem, cleft palate along with the cleft palate. Okay, so three big issues here. And the incidence is, of course, one in 10,000 normally, or some of them say that from it ranges from 8,000 8, to 14,000. Okay, next one. The question here now, there are, we ourselves have actually developed a lot of protocols and you can see in the net. Next one. What you wanted to Mild, moderate to severe. Again, like what I have said about other uh, classifications. Some children even failure to thrive, cannot feed, cannot sleep, severe obstruction, severe obstruction. Mouth opening is restricted and it's a big problem with it. Okay, so what you want to really do with it. Next one. So in such cases, next one, please. In such cases, after appropriate investigation, you have to do CT scans and sometimes there was scopy and all those things. We discussed that actually during that other webinar with the distraction. Next one. What we wanted to do here, non-surgical. First, putting it on the side and see prone position, side lateral position is very important. And the success rate, some of you say that 70%, you'll not believe it. Normally a child, we say that it will go into the prone, the side position only at the end of uh, sometimes uh, four to six months. But with the Peary Robin, the nature has given, you know, sort of a, such a beautiful, uh, this thing, the child can go to the prone side position within one week or even two weeks without even knowing, without even the mother doing it, the child will go because the, the child is trying to get accommodated of breathing. Okay. Sometimes there, you know, you can put a nasopharyngeal stent. There are some custom-made stents are available, but all this will have only temporary purpose. Okay, the best thing is if we can, child can survive without any surgical intervention with uh, all these simple non-surgical technique. That's the best thing about it. No doubt about it. Okay, next one. Let us say, suppose if the child is not able to survive, patient can be intubated, but how long? You can't do that for a long time. You can do it for two days, three days, one week. How long you can do it? In the past, people never, a lot of people do tracheostomy. And some of them carry tracheostomy for two years and three years. But that's not an answer nowadays. So then people thought, why can't we stitch that lip to the tongue? Because the tongue is a problem. The tongue falling back is always the issue. So you pull the tongue and stitch forward like what you see it here. Pull the tongue, stitch it forward to the lip what is called as tongue lip hydration, TLP, most commonest procedures done in the world now. And people find in a long term, this does the trick of improving the airway in Pierre Robin sequence. Okay, this improves the swallowing. You have to train the baby with a uh, naso uh, uh, gastric tube. You, for at least about, it takes about at least seven to 10 days in the neonatal ICU to train the baby to swallow, then slowly, from nasal to oral, you can start the feeding. The tongue is stitched for, remember, you try to swallow yourself, all of you, put, it, put the tongue, put it out and try to swallow it, you know how the difficulty it is. Very difficult to do it, to swallow it, with the tongue out like that. But it does, child will accustom, can leave it for one year, let the nutrition improve. You can see a child like that here. We have done that successfully in one of, you know, in many patients. One of the child like that, the child has put on weight. From that, you know, such a bad nutrition, difficult in breathing, you can bring it like this. But the child in nutrition is improved, the mandible continues to be the same and the patient had obstructive sleep apnea. So there are two options you have here. One is tongue lip adhesion, or you can go straight forward. I have seen in, uh, specifically in the USA, there are a lot of senders, I saw after immediately on the next day or second day or third day or fifth day, they put the distractor. You start distracting it. First day they do a five millimeter of distraction. 
you know what is the intention here is to improve the airway on the spot it does a wonder the child start breathing and that shows the distractor you know in my case we did it after about 3 months to improve 3 to 6 months to improve it bring the mandible back to normal and this is an internal distractor what we had put in only problem with this internal distractor is that you have to go back and remove it okay that is instead of that one lot of people are nowadays using external distractors next one uh, you can see sorry you can see in this picture i think dr elevenel can actually point can you point the next one here the second pictures showing the growth of the uh, mandible next one please from a deficient mandible to the growth of the mandible here this is still the distractor you can see the distractor in place behind the, the in front of the ear here this is the distraction at the end of distraction so we push the mandible forward instead of pulling it we push the max the mandible forward the distraction is done from the behind the mandible please remember that okay and you can see here the uh, uh, the the apnea index hypopnea index improved from 35 to 6 drastic improvement the patient start breathing normally everything will improve the lung function the heart function everything will improve because prolonged sleep apnea can produce a lot of issues to the patient as the patient grows next one please extraoral technique next one so what did we learn from this all this uh, after a long time 20 years of treatment majority of the cases what we have done is uh, nowadays tongue lip aeration it is necessary 20% of cases very good success okay resort to other methods only if if they fail to thrive again cat tracheostomy 20 years hardly we do it now they will improve the obstructive sleep apnea in a fantastic way parents child everybody is happy with it really okay additional surgery of distraction only if it is necessary thank you next one yeah we'll finish this okay next one Sir, question number uh, there is a question on specific criteria for uh, condylectomy in treatment of condylar hyperplasia right so we know about it what is condylar hyperplasia is basically there is an exaggerated growth in the condyle alone this is different from condylar that is condylar the mandibular hemi mandibular elongation hemi mandibular hypertrophy or hyperplasia the question was very specific on condylar hyperplasia okay when does this happen can you go to the next one please etiology there are a lot of proposed one we do not know what happens to the condyle into the in the condyle but i think excessive proliferation some say that it is genetic some says that there is an excessive loading on the cmj we do not know there is a lot of influence on the hormonal and the arthrosis are uh, been suggested some says childhood infection sometimes and some says that there is a hypervascularity all this can produce isolated condylar growth when there is an isolated condylar growth you will have all problems of the ramus can grow the mandible can grow the patient becomes asymmetry you can get an asymmetry of the entire condyle entire face okay and the growth of the condyle is keep on growing and they can grow till the age completion happens okay Eleven. Uh, are you so? Uh, are you having some slides on this picture as well? Yeah. Uh, Have we got that? Okay. Okay. Don't worry. Yes. So, how do you know now that? Uh, 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 I think I had seen one of the uh, slides uh, we had actually put in. Can you just keep going? Sir, uh, picture right? of what, sir? Picture. The spect that is showing right. the. Uh, No, sir, not. Not there. It's okay. Don't worry. So, what we normally do, we normally do a, a you know, we can do a simple uh, X-ray like OPG. You take a CT scan, and you find suddenly the condyle is growing more than the normal. So, you wanted to know why it is growing. So, you can do what is called as a technetium ninety nine scan. That is called a single photoluminescent, you know, sort of scan spect. Okay, this spect will show 
decreased uptake of stake in ethereum 99 on the affected side you compare it with the opposite side anything more than 10 percent is considered as abnormal okay anything more considered more than 10 percent is considered as abnormal so you have to study first whether there is actual increase in activity actual increase in activity compared to the other affect unaffected side number one number two okay when can you intervene intervening i think we can do it normally this comes starts from the age of 8 10 only sometimes even 10 11 and complete goes up to 20 years some cases have gone up to 25 years as well you have to wait for the growth of the condyle to you know complete normally so we have to sometimes we have to do one or two spect analysis or technique in 99 analysis next one please once you do that you plan for the uh, removal of the part of the condyle on the shape on the top superficial area so you have to resect the condyle idea is resection of the condyle is to done whatever the excess condyle you can remove it okay how much to remove it that's always the question minimum is three millimeter but you can do up to seven millimeter okay that may be combined with bsso or a leaf photo one depend upon the type of facial deformity you have it whether you have a asymmetry what is the extent of asymmetry you have to be done with it many people sometimes i hear that some first correction of uh, condyle alone go back wait for some time go back after six months then or three months then do the sag and the uh, leaf photo but nowadays the tendency because that we have a better planning with the cat cam technology and everything you can do a simultaneous correction of condyle along with the leaf foot and the sagittal split osteotomy okay next one and this is i think the recent uh, article i saw in the net that i have not done it but i just saw you know you what you see here is uh, you know condylar hyperplasia asymmetry you can make a guide Nowadays, lots of guide for everything. There is a guide. Even to make incisions, you will find in future some guide will be available. So that is beauty of it. Really, you know, we are getting into digital scenario. Really, so you have a guide. The guide will tell you where to cut and how to shape the condyle. That's the beauty of it. So it will exactly plan. Okay, you can remove this much, and you can make it symmetrical to the other side. So you can use a guide. Next one. Okay, I think, can we take this, the question? This is a different question, sir. Uh, yeah. This is regarding a surgical treatment of unilateral condylar hyperplasia. Mm -hmm. Whether you would go for a proportional condylectomy or orthognathic surgery. I think it is both really. You know, I have to defer the surgery till it stops as we already mentioned here. See, what is the difference compared to what we have mentioned already in that case? So here, there is a hemimandibular elongation. Okay, hemimandibular elongation. The entire ramus, the entire mandible on one side is elongated. Please remember that up to the midline. And sometimes the chin point also can deviate. Chin point also can deviate. So we normally tend to, if there is no severe hyperplasia of the condyle alone, you can wait till the age complete. Okay. In the childhood, what you can do it, you can do some uh, interceptive orthodontics and try to do some amount of correction but sometimes that will not stop it from, you know, uh, growing. So you wait for the growth to complete. Okay, then proceed, what we mentioned already, then proceed with the condylar surgery along with uh, uh, staged orthognathic procedure, either in two stage or in course. Now, what we do, it is a single surgery. We do the condyle, leaf out one and sagittal split, everything together, along with lower border excessive resection can be done in one shot lower border resection to make it uh, equal to that of the opposite side unaffected side it can be done in one stage uh, does that answer the question uh, 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 yes sir yes sir yeah i think we have to we have to can you uh, let us see okay inactive okay you mentioned as an inactive condyle this is what is very important okay that is residual asymmetry can be corrected according to the conventional orthogonal principle restore symmetry and, and nowadays we have if you take a ct scan you have fantastic uh, you know the uh, softwares which you can do a lot of playing plan 
with what you want to do with it mandibular oste osteotomy you can do a good outcome with the compensatory you know maxillary dental alveolar compens lot of things you can do with it now i will go because of this uh, you know uh, uh, advancement in technique and everything we still have a good chance of doing everything in one shot if the uh, once the the activity complete once the growth complete go with the one shot again next one please yeah i think you have you have mentioned here actually okay clinical uh, staging clinical asymmetry spect what you have mentioned here 12 yes, month sir. observation condyla reduction 12 month observation orthodontics orthognathic surgery lower body reduction and genioplasty whatever necessary okay one can go through i think there are a lot of articles which explain about it yeah next one please condyla reduction and you can see here beautifully see look at it this is advantage of having a software you can plan everything go in with proper guides cutting guides go properly with uh, you know nowadays you have a, a guide uh, splints and uh, patient specific implant what else you want everything available for you and planned and do it including to cut the lower border of the mandible you have a specific guide we are already crossing 1 hour 15 minutes thank you i'm sorry jimson is going to kill me this is the time. last last question sir oh right okay uh, there's a question on computational fluid dynamics the uses very good i think uh, you know i do not know how many of we just know about this but it's very important to understand a lot of things are coming in this now okay so what is computational fluid dynamics i started working on this about 5 years ago uh, when i heard from one of the team who are working on uh, this uh, you know uh, bio technology group and they were working on it they were studying the velocity of the uh, uh, fluid like the blood vessel on the uh, you know lot of brain then i asked them then they say that you can also study on the air the velocity of the air i said how we are not going to see the air that's a, that something which we do not know when when we take the x rays or ct scan or anything we don't see the air in fact you don't know where to see it but if you take a ct or mri actually that can be actually seen through the mri or ct the the people with the proper software actually they can see the air passing through it okay so there a branch of fluid dynamics that uses numerical solutions of the governing equations for simulating real fluid flows so what you don't see with your eye in ct and mri can be seen with the software the air passing from nose to the lungs nose entry point of the nose to the lungs you can really see it if you take the entire mri ct scan you can go up to the alveoli what happens you can see see here the picture can you go to the picture yeah you can see from the nose till the airway so what all the things you can study you can study see that you can study the uh, the the blood flow the, the you can study the air flow resistance flow rate the uh, uh, the pressure what is including the turbulence and shear and uh, we did this about you know nearly about 20 cases in our center to study what happens to the air flow in a cleft uh, uh, deformity patient and septorhinoplasty okay I, i think it's very important to understand what we don't see in uh, normally in this thing and if we can study it it gives us a lot of answers what happens to the flow when you do a septorhinoplasty Plasty. That that's all about the computational dynamics. Of plastic. And thank you so much. I think we are yes, running out of time. That was the last. Uh, I'll question. take the question. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I think it took a lot of time. So, so there, there is. I mean, you you explained so much in detail that there are there aren't many questions in the chat box. But then uh, just a few uh, ones. Uh, sir, there is one on uh, management of scar contracture, intraoral oral versus extraoral. Would you would you use anything to manage scar intraorally? very difficult question to understand to be very frank because you know uh, that is in a cleft palate you are talking about or uh, there is no mention of it but uh, general intraoral is there yeah, a of course, of course there is intraoral intra for a cleft palate for example if you can avoid the secondary defect as much as possible it is best no doubt about it okay sir so which is very difficult to explain because if you have a wide cleft palate you have no other choice you have to bring it in a side and you have to go into it. Otherwise, we have to do what is called as two-stage technique. 
you close the soft palate first, then do the anterior closed later stage. You can reduce the amount of uh, lateral, uh, medial amount of the cleft palate. But if you ask me really, you know, sort of uh, uh, whether we can really close in, in, in uh, to reduce under percent, meticulous closure, very, very important, meticulous closure. I use even today in trural closure, I don't use less than 40 or 50 vicryl, okay? Very small bite. I normally do two layer closure, specifically for uh, leaf out or any other procedures. Use a 40 or 50 vicryl, which can be very, very small as possible. I have seen, you will not believe it, I have seen Professor Seiler, one of our mentors uh, for the cleft from Switzerland. He uses a subcutaneous vicryl, then in the mucosa to close it, he uses 50 ethylone. Mm. And it just pulls it in after 10 days. Absolutely no suture done on the mucosa to reduce a scar in the intraoral area. Sure, sir. And inter externally, I already told you, I use less tension, very important, less tension, one factor. Okay, number two, good suturing technique. Number three, smaller as possible. Okay, number four, the correct timing of removal. Very important. Number five, Maintaining the wound without infection. If you have an infection, no doubt the scar is going to improve it. It is going to go. It is going to go to a lot of problems it will create. Clean wound, no tension, good vascularity, smaller the suture, correct suture removal with certain adhesions like, you know, you can do little strips to hold the lip in place and, you know, the nose in place. All these things will help it. Thank you. Sure, sir. Just one last question, sir. What is yeah. the youngest age at which, at, at which you would start with this traction? The youngest age. Uh, I'll, it's all depend upon what is the indication. For example, as I told you, for a peri robin, you can do within four to five days. If you have a center where you can treat all these things in a, in a good in intensive care facility, anesthetic to cover it up, I don't think there should be any concern. In a child with a, a, a hemifacial microsomia, you can start, I have done as early as one year. No problems. Depend upon what is the problem, whether this is the type one, two or a three, depend upon that. I had patients with type two A, I have done as early as one year. Sure, sir. As early as one year. There's, I don't think there's any restriction in doing it. There's no restriction. I don't think basically, so. Basically dependent on the type of problem the kid has. Absolutely, yes whether it's a type one or, no, or what is the issue is all about. For example, if you have a toucher colon syndrome, you have to do bilateral distractor. If you have a facility to do it, a good intensive care setup, a good uh, setup of uh, 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 distractors with you, if you have the expertise to do it, you do it immediately after, uh, you know, probably three months, six months, you can start doing it. Once the airway is, uh, if you wanted to improve it, I don't think there is any reason to wait. You can do it. Yes, as early as possible distraction. Sure, sir. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sir, because of paucity of time, uh, Jimson, sir, can thank we you. move? Thank you very much, uh, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Jimson, sir, thank can you, we sir. move on to the next session? Yes, 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 please. Yeah. Uh, Jim, thank you so much. I, I, I took a little time. I'm trying no to problem, sir, but, but, but your explanation was fantastic. So I'm sure all so the people, uh, yeah, yeah, we very benefited. Only thing is that Sai has got less time now. Yes, sir. <laughs> He's a small man, so he'll take less time. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Mani, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir, you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So we now uh, move on to the next session on cosmetic surgery. Dr. Sainath? Yeah, good yeah. evening. Uh, good evening, good evening, sir. Good evening, Sainath. Great presentation. Can we can we start with the session, Sai? Okay. the The first question is on um, the different types of hair transplantation and uh, their success rates. Okay. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Yeah. See, just first we'll uh, talk about the definition of hair transplant surgery or hair restoration surgery, which uh, is commonly called as. It's an art and craft in the surgical science um, where the uh, the tissue uh, or the graft is harvested from the permanent hair bearing, like the occipital region where there is no receptor activities, sorry, BHG activities, and then transplanted to the area which is suffering from alopecia. This is coined by, okay? And after the phase of initial effluvium, 
what is effluvium? <clears throat> effluvium is nothing but a stage from the time of the surgery and uh, the hair will undergo antigen to telogen conversion and then they start falling. And after three months or two months, uh, normally 45 to 60 days, when the effluvium stage is complete, the new hair starts growing in the transplanted region. And coming to the types, broadly it is classified into FUT and FUE. Uh, FUT is the first procedure um, uh, which found by and uh, it has been uh, popularized and still we do a follicular unit transplant. And follicular unit extraction after um, James Harris um, uh, modified with uh, micro punches. This uh, technique became very popular where they take the individual graft and uh, need not have much of technicians, the surgeon, and a couple of uh, nurses is enough for the. But only thing is, it takes a long time uh, when compared to FUT. And there's another technique called DHI, which is uh, commercially popularized, but uh, they have published an article as well, but it is not uh, considered as a different procedure. It also comes under a FUE technique. Uh, the technique, it is not FUS. Um, uh, it is actually a few Okay, uh, go on next. Uh, coming to the next, can you go to the next slide? Yeah. Uh, coming to the success rate, see, there are many factors involved in the success rate. Like, um, I'm doing a surgery on a head, I mean, I'm doing a head transplant surgery. Of all the hairs will grow. What is the percentage of failure of the graft? It depends on the skill of the surgeon, how fast you do, how meticulously you do, whether it is an FUT or an FUT. FUT again taking the strip or the strip, taking the graft from the occipital region, you should be in a proper depth that is up to the subcutaneous fat region where you will see the follicles, see that the fat are maintained. Don't go below the fat, uh, don't expose the gallia, um, and, uh, and uh, the skill of the technician, how fast they cut uh, the graft into two and three follicular units or singular follicular units, and then storage solution. There is lot of controversies which is going on how to store the graft whether it's in saline solution or PRP now uh, the latest thing is hypothermal salts like which maintains the solution in a cold state we always use any uh, solution like ringer lactate or saline or a PRP in a chilled uh, form uh, so that the imbibition will not take place uh, then coming to the patient's scalp on the hair quality scalp like uh, uh, Cerboric dermatitis, um, all these other uh, psoriasis, all these conditions going to again affect the results. The time, you, you cannot do a surgery for a long time. Normally, hair, hair transplant takes around uh, six to nine hours, but see that you're really fast enough to harvest and implant because the maximum time, according to the Limmer and the Unger study, says not more than eight hours you, uh, you can uh, prolong your surgery because uh, the, the graft will die of ischemia and uh, dehydration. Again, damage to the follicular units. When you're doing a follicular unit extraction, see that you do a very nice punch without uh, transecting the grafts. And the post-operative care, with infections and other uh, problems, what uh, regularly any surgery can face, and the patient systemic factors like diabetes, and any other autoimmune disorders, all these things can affect the success rate. But normally, if you see the success rate, it is uh, if, if, if all this criteria meets well, uh, you're going to have a 90 to 95 percent of the drop success. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Uh, yeah, in this, uh, there's a study. See, this is not actually the classification of the types of, uh, uh, what do you call that, uh, the procedure. These are all the types, like DFU means double, uh, di follicular unit, tri follicular unit, quarter follicular units. So when you're doing a slits, when you're slivering the graft, you either do it in a two grafts or three grafts or four grafts, then uh, make it into a micro or a small or a medium slit, then place the graft. These are the various types of uh, uh, grafts which uh, the, the technicians normally uh, sleeve it, uh, the study which has been done. So, um, 
you can't have a five uh, follicular units or a six. You can, but uh, the outcome will be so unnatural that when somebody sees on forehead, they can easily find it's like you know crops coming out from the hairy feet. So it's better to stay on a double or a triple graft and a single graft, especially the front line single and double should make the best uh, natural outcome. Next slide, please. Can I okay, go to the next? Question. The next question is on uh, the different indications for Botox. Botox, yeah. Uh, coming to the botulinum toxin now, it's um, getting very famous uh, for both the therapeutic and for the cosmetic. And I think most of them are going for the cosmetic uh, and uh, being in maxillofacial surgery, working in collagen and other problems. We see some of the patients, we are giving a therapeutic uh, uh, injection of botulinum toxins. And uh, this is called a sausage poison because botulus in German mean, uh, Latin means a sausage. And uh, there's another uh, reason also why they call this uh, sausage poison because it acts between the, uh, uh, the neuromuscular junction plate uh, to stop releasing the acetylcholine. Um, can, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, it's there. So it blocks the uh, release of the acetylcholine and therapeutic like temporomandibular joint disorders, bruxism, facial pain, uh, gum smiles, orthodontic relapse. Um, there's so many other conditions which uh, we are using, but uh, um, I think uh, everybody should read this article from Majid, uh, who was published in the International Journal. Uh, which uh, gives all the indications. And uh, I think I'm a little uh, talking about the temporomandibular joint and muscular hypertrophy and uh, gummy smiles later in this, in this talk. So we will we'll skip on to the next slide, yes. Okay, uh, this is about uh, the different steps involved in facelift procedure. Facelift, uh, facelift is, um, it's a, uh, and not many of the maxillofacial surgeons are doing it here, um, uh, maybe in India, but in countries, facelift and necklift is very popular. Uh, it's also called as a rightidectomy, you know, uh, normally what we call. And uh, uh, generations of subcutaneous dissection and uh, smash plication or imbrication or deep smash lips. The way, uh, the lot of uh, procedures involved, and uh, coming to the steps, like uh, Dr. Bailey, the steps involved means the surgical steps. Yeah, the surgical steps. You're right. Okay, so first we'll see what what are the face lifts uh, we have. It started from 1824. Um, then uh, only the skin only lift where they don't uh, use a regular rectitectomy incision. Uh, and skin only or mini lifts, they make just a small. Uh, incision on the temporal, uh, temporal auricular region or a small uh, the pre-auricular or uh, below the earlobe, wherever there's a jowling. Uh, actually, to be honest, when you talk about facelift, it's better you should know about the facial fat. Facial fat is classified into superficial and deep, where you have infraorbital, medial, middle, trans, uh, lateral transparatal, uh, then you have supra jowl, infra jowl. So based on that, you're going to decide what kind of face lift you're going to do, and uh, and you all know what is mass superficial uh, muscular or neurotic system, which is nothing but it's investing the whole facial muscles. So you can see just below the dermis and the facial muscles, there's a layer in between. Superiorly extends as temporoparietal fascia and inferiorly. Uh, Parfidomacetric, and then it goes to the investing layer of deep cervical and deep glottis. I mean, superficial glottis. So uh, we are seeing uh, skin only lifts, low mass lifts like uh, plication, imbrication. I'll be talking that uh, in the next slide, please. Again, uh, you go And this is DDoS classification. There's always a question uh, when you're doing a face lift: Is it a rule that we have to combine with the neck lift? But nowadays, it is a mandatory because uh, of the infra and the super jowling region and in the uh, mentalis region, there is a double, I mean, the, the platysmal fat and the super jowl and infra jowl fat also uh, comes down as the uh, uh, aging process. 
So 95% of the patients who operated for facelifts, they undergo even the neck lift. So this is some of the, uh, one of the classification by DDoS, uh, which still they follow. And based on this, uh, we, we decide what kind of uh, facelift you want, whether you need to do a smasectomy or a purgation or um, uh, uh, smasplication and uh, how, how much of the tissue is to be removed uh, and uh, what about the sling, uh, the zygomatic sling, uh, ligaments, what you have. Uh, so, and uh, uh, not only that, there, there are many other procedures uh, like a suspension of the SMAS layer to the temporalis uh, fascia, suspension of the inferior uh, jowl region to the mastoid region. So all these things will define the uh, mandible and the, and the root or the uh, malar region. Uh, next slide, please. Be uh, uh, basically, uh, it is either done under local anesthesia and, uh, and on a mild sedation, or you can take a patient in uh, under general anesthesia. But I prefer doing that in local anesthesia with a mild sedation because uh, you can always check the patient. In, when doing a facelift, it is very important that you have to preserve the patient nerve. Most of the time, the frontal branch, when you are uh, dissecting the frontal branch and the buccal branch are most likely to get uh, injured. So um, you can, uh, you can uh, uh, anesthetize, uh, give a local anesthesia to the patient uh, along with the tumescent. Uh, tumescent, what we use is uh, one in uh, 90,000 dilution of uh, adrenaline and 6.4% uh, of sodium metabisulfide, um, sorry, sodium bicarbonate. And uh, we inject uh, in the, the pre-auricular region, uh, uh, infralobular region, and in the mastoid region. And it also acts as a hydro dissection. And then you plan uh, your incision like uh, from the hairline, from the hairline, you palpate all this for the superficial temporal artery and then um, go reach the superior border of the helix. Um, then uh, just uh, wind inside the helix, uh, go inside the tracheus, and then wind around the, uh, the uh, lobe of the ear and go back on the posterior auricular region. Either you, uh, you continue with the hairline or just go inside the hairline. Now, the dissection should start supra-inferior and postero-anterior. That's how it should be. And uh, the plane is very important. Always go at the subcutaneous uh, 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 down uh, the fat region and uh, then you uh, land up with this mass. See that you don't touch this mass initially unless you do a full dissection. Later on, uh, once you uh, then uh, try to uh, manipulate uh, holding the smash layer and uh, see the outer, uh, yeah, the skin region, how, how the lift is going to be uh, either on the neck or in the cheek region or the mala region. And based on that, you either do a smash plication. 90, 80 to 85% of uh, the surgeons prefer a smash plication or an uh, imbrication rather than smashectomy because uh, you can't lose the fat which is present, which is very important. Sometimes they, uh, most of these patients, uh, they lack fat. So uh, as an adjuvant therapy, we take abdominal fat and uh, inject uh, for the fullness. Um, uh, and uh, and for the small wrinkles uh, on, the, on the skin region, we use the emulsification of fat and then uh, inject it. So once you dissect, and uh, I, I have a um, uh, nerve stimulator uh, where I always check for the frontal branch once I dissect. And then once I uh, start, uh, can you go to the next slide? Uh, is there any? Uh, yeah. So, uh, so based on uh, the... Uh, the, how much of uh, amount of the elevation you need. Uh, we plan for application or uh, implication, especially for two and three stages of uh, DDoS classification with uh, more of infra jowling. Uh, we, we go for implication and less of uh, jowling, we go for application. And there is many, uh, many standpoints to be noted. Uh, if uh, you start with the face lift along with the neck lift, first we, we make a small incision on the inframetal region, we dissect the whole platysma. And then uh, do a, uh, we use the platysma as the anchorage, uh, do a platysma application from this, cross over the sutured material, anchor in the uh, angle of the mandible, again anchor in the mastoid region. For the face, uh, start uh, from the modulus, uh, take it to the infrazygmatic region, and then uh, anchor to the, uh, to the 
uh, to the you know, temporal aspasia. Um, if it is going to plication, uh, you try to overlap and uh, sorry, uh, you're going to fold and then suture it. If in the case of imbrication, you're going to separate or cut the uh, you know, mass layer and then overlap it and suture it. So the and then um, reposition the skin, cut the excess skin, and uh, and uh, suture with the I use a five zero proline. And uh, for inside this mass plication uh, or imbrication or the suturing of uh, the platysma, I use a two zero or a three zero PDS suture, which uh, which uh, really holds in a good way and uh, a nice suture material to be used. Uh, next. Yeah, so, uh, uh, the, inc the way is incision pattern, this is how you go and uh, you can see uh, the stepwise uh, elevation of the flap and uh, uh, always leave one centimeter uh, from the tragus and then uh, go dissect this mass layer, whether you want to do an integration or, uh, or application and then suture it uh, up to the neck level and then approximate your skin then start suturing it. And uh, one, one important point I would like to tell in this uh, face lift or neck lift. The common question is uh, whether you'll get, see a scar in uh, the pre, uh, pre auricular region. See, in Western people, because of the skin nature, uh, they, uh, they, the scar uh, actually uh, uh, is camouflaged. Whereas in Indian skin, sometimes uh, you may see, uh, especially in the Fitzpatrick uh, scale of uh, skin, uh, you will see uh, for one, two, and three, you will not see much of scar. Whereas four, five, six, you will see a small line. That's why we, uh, when you make an incision, you pull a little bit inside the tragus uh, and then uh, come out so that the scar is uh, hidden inside. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the indications and contraindications for fillers. Yeah. Am, I, uh, am I going too fast or uh, is it? No, no, it's perfectly fine. Perfectly fine. Thank you. Indications and contraindication for filler. Uh, yes, uh, fillers. Uh, this is actually a very, very uh, broad topic. Yes, fillers are the uh, are the uh, uh, substance which you are going to inject uh, either sub uh, um, uh, dermally. And uh, uh, and uh, the uh, dermal fillers also you have uh, uh, permanent fillers and temporary fillers maybe between six to eight months. Uh, and next slide, uh, please. Yeah, uh, some of the contraindication. The main contraindication is the immunocompromised patient autoimmune disorders and other inflammatory disorders like pyoderma and uh, inflammatory conditions like uh, dermatitis, cerebroic, lichen planus, uh, active psoriasis patients, all these things uh, better avoid uh, doing fillers. But yes, uh, fat, uh, we are going to take an autologous fat. So in those uh, autologous fat uh, uh, injection, I don't think so you need to uh, take much of uh, uh, it's not contraindicated because it's an autologous. Uh, whereas when you're going to use an hyaluronic acid, yes, all these uh, 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 things to be taken into consideration. Next. Uh, oh, it's a question. Okay. okay. Uh, the therapeutic non-surgical aesthetic procedures, uh, what are they, especially about the role of Botox? In therapeutic non-surgical aesthetic procedures, okay. The role of Botox, yeah, okay. Yeah, see, um, uh, Botox, as I told you, the therapeutic, uh, uh, basically it's gonna paralyze the muscle. And that's what uh, we normally say. Uh, so what happens is, it is going to go for an atrophy. So mesotric uh, hypertrophy, when you're going to inject, the muscle is not going to work, so it is going to go for atrophy and the bulkness is going to be 
again, if you talk about uh, mesentric hypertrophy, it can be unilateral or bilateral. The cause can be many. And most of the time, uh, my patients, they comply with uh, both temporalis and the masita, um, especially the patients with proxism and, and all, sometimes they all go for an anger management as well uh, because of too much of stress level and uh, some uh, psychological uh, disturbance. So in those patients, if you see, you will see a classic dumbbell uh, uh, shape deformity on both sides where the temporal is also, you will see the bulge and the muscle also, you will see the bulge. So uh, we use Botox and uh, uh, initially the patient gets a really good results, but you need to continue this for at least three, four sittings every four months. And then slowly uh, the, the muscle bulk reduces. Um, and the three black dots, what uh, is given uh, on the picture, that's where I, I uh, inject uh, maybe uh, 10 to 15 units per, per dot. So it's almost 30 units on one side. Um, and uh, wait for four months to five months for the patient to come back for the second injection. You'll see a very good results after two injections and uh, it, it really works out really well. And uh, next slide. Uh, and, uh, yeah, botulinum toxin A and the temporal. Yes, as I told you, uh, most of the time the temporalis and the masita uh, combination they'll have a hypertrophy, and uh, Botox can be used as uh, a very good uh, agent to reduce this. And it also uh, uh, acts on nociceptors by you know um, by releasing uh, uh, um, the intracellular compartment uh, agents, and even the pain is reduced. Um, mostly they say uh, electromyographic uh, guided injection or ultrasound guided injection are better but masseter and temporalis I think you can feel with your tactile sensation um, as the patient the clench and you'll see the bulk of the muscle and give. whereas my experience on temporomandibular joint I hope Dr. Eleven will also know when we are uh, uh, working in SRM uh, we uh, did a uh, uh, I guided a postgraduate student uh, injecting the botulinum toxin into the lateral pterygoid. See, lateral pterygoid is the only muscle which can depress the mandible. But how to identify lateral pterygoid? It's not easy like a temporalis or a masseter. So there are two techniques. Uh, we need to locate the upper head because it is attached to the disc. So all these patients compliant with anterior disc displacement with reduction. So you will see a pain and a clicking sound. So our aim was, and objective of the study was to reduce the pain and the clicking. So we uh, planned injection of 25 units of Botox in the lateral pterygoid on each side using electromyographic study. Now the question is, how we did we use electromyographic study? So we used a long needle uh, and, and then connected to the electromyographic port. And we asked to, uh, we, we used the Gauguet's technique to reach the anteroinferior portion of the uh, contact. Uh, intraorally and we uh, ask the patient to open the mouth and close. So when the patient opens, you will see the spike. So it means that you are in the lateral pterygoid. And there's another technique on extraoral along the external artery and just uh, palpate for the, uh, the condyle and just go anteriorly and give it to the uh, uh, lateral pterygoid muscle. Uh, the results came out really well and uh, we gave uh, consecutively uh, two sets of injection every fourth month and uh, uh, there was 48, uh, within 48 hours, there's a disappearance of uh, the click. Um, uh, it is also there published in, uh, in a British journal, uh, I forgot the name, it was in 2005, uh, British journal article. So it was a pilot study which has been done and uh, even the, those results were really uh, challenging. Uh, next, please. Next slide. A gummy smile, again, gummy smile, um, uh, it's, it can be a therapeutic, uh, but most of, most of the time the patient comes uh, with me to uh, correct the gummy smile and most of them have vertical maxillary excess or lower shortening of the upper lip. See, you have to diagnose where the problem lies. Is it in the skeletal or is it in, this, uh, uh, in, the, in the soft tissue uh, on the lip? Uh, some people have an exaggerated smile, like they, they, the, the expression when they smile itself is different. So it's very important to diagnose a patient and then take them to treat with botulinum toxin or the gummy spike, especially uh, the, the uh, muscles which uh, give a, 
which act too much on the upper lip is uh, levator labia, like when I say the transverse nasalis and levator labia superior, all these three muscles join the lateral aspect of the ala on both the sides, and this is how the pull takes place. So we give 15, 15 units on uh, both the sides. See, uh, you don't uh, uh, change the uh, the place. You give exactly on the same uh, area uh, on both the sides. And uh, for 48 hours, uh, you'll see uh, there's much reduction of the gummy smile. And uh, uh, don't overdose this because it's going to paralyze and the patient cannot uh, speak. And it will be like uh, uh, um, uh, the feeling of... Uh, uh, um, but uh, when, you, when you inject a local anesthesia, the same feel, they, they will not have an expression on the upper lip. They, it, it falls off, it droops off. So see that you don't give more than 15 minutes on each side. Okay, the next question is on um, the different chemical fields in maxillofacial surgery. Can you go back to the... Uh, Dr. Sai, can you hear? Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, sorry. The, the next slide, sorry. I thought yeah. I didn't. Yeah. This is about uh, the different types of chemical peels in maxillofacial surgery. Use of chemical peels. See, uh, Dr. Vainal, I think.
yeah 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 thank you uh, mani sir for your exhaustive <laughs> lecture and it is uh, i'm sure it will be very useful for the post graduates and uh, sorry yet again you also your fantastic presentation uh, thank you both and thank you dr ilamenil for the moderation and uh, and uh, none of the postgraduates left uh, if at all they left the room again they managed to come back so it was almost 100 every time and it will be it's already recorded and it will be uh, in uh, youtube by tomorrow morning so there is some again a technical issue today we are not able to go live on youtube uh, let me see what 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 we can do and sort it out yeah thank you and uh, dr reena ma'am is also here you would like to add a couple of words yeah ma'am is there not able to hear that thank you ma'am Yeah, yes sir thank you now dr elaminil will have to pose a question for the post graduates thank you mani sir and sai okay yeah yeah thank you thank you sir and i'll catch you tomorrow i'll call you
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Last session. Yeah, today it was a disaster. <laughs> and yeah, it is not working. Now my audio is working, in the, not in working the laptop. I am connected through my mobile for the audio and video in my laptop. And the speed of my internet is 40 Mbps. Still, <laughs> I think next time we'll give the screen sharing to the speakers itself provided there is no internet issue <laughs> <laughs> I think you can close. <laughs> close. Yeah. Yeah. One minute, somebody is asking for the link for Sunday. I can't copy and paste it here now. Yeah, I will, I will, yeah. Thank you, we'll end the session then. Okay, I'm ending the session. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night.